All right, friends and neighbors, welcome to this week's networking video. We are continuing our voice over IP journey with part three, catching a voice. Now, when you're communicating with somebody else, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're communicating via a very traditional DTMF phone, a digital phone, a voice over IP phone, a cell phone, a headset and mic connected to a computer. And it doesn't matter if you're dealing with wiring infrastructure like this or wiring infrastructure that looks like this, meaning telephony or data wiring. Um, eventually you're gonna go to a, a switch and then down to somebody else. But no matter what kind of mechanism you're using to communicate with the other person, and no matter what kind of mechanism they're using to listen to you, at some point you have to capture the voice. You have to take the sounds that are coming out of your mouth and somehow get it to the other person's ear. And it turns out that all of these systems do it in almost exactly the same way. So what are our sort of collection of steps that we have to go through? Well, we know that we're generating sound waves. So we're gonna collect those sound waves and convert them to electrical signals. And then at some point, we're gonna convert them to ones and zeros. Now, the ones and zeros might be straight up ones and zeros that are transmitted across the wire in some kind of organi organized uh, fashion. Or they might be packetized like we do in voice over IP. They might be wired or wireless. So we could be talking about analog or digital transmission. We could be talking about analog or digital data. And the conversion that we're talking about here could happen on the phone. It could happen on a telco switch like a 5ESS and a subscriber line card at the central office somewhere. Or it could happen on your computer. It doesn't matter. They're all doing the same thing. And then at the other end, we have to reverse the whole process. We have to somehow take these ones and zeros, convert them to an analog wave, and then transmit them so the other person can pick up the sound waves. Now the thing that does this is a codec, which is short for coder decoder. As the name might suggest, we're going to encode a whole bunch of data, send it across the network, and then decode it so that we can listen to it again. So again, the key ideas are that we're gonna pull in the sound waves, and then the, the key word and tricky phrase is we're going to sample the sine waves. So in this particular graphic, we can see the vertical lines, those represent the samples, or the, the number of samples per second that you're gonna do. And then we're also gonna quantize them. So we're gonna provide an amplitude value for each, each sample that we take. And then we're gonna figure out how to transmit the data. Now we're not really worried about transmitting the data today, right? We'll talk about that in maybe another, another talk, but uh, the important idea is that you're gonna sample it and then you're gonna provide a value for each one of those samples, transmit the data, and maybe, depending on the kind of transmission you're worried about, we might do some compression. Now that whole process is called pulse code modulation or PCM. And the standard that sort of rules them all, the standard that we all start with, is ITUT G.711, MULAW or ALAW, depending on where you live. I'm in North America, we use MULAW here. But first, a word about frequencies. Now what I've got here on the screen in front of you right now is two different ranges. One is the range of hearing, and one is the range of sound generation or vocalization. So we can see on the top that humans have the capability to hear somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And then of course, almost every animal in the animal kingdom is a little bit better than that. On the bottom, we have the range of frequencies that we can generate. Now, no matter what kind of baritone you are, there's a limit to how low you can go. And so I think the world record is somewhere down around 40 or 50 or whatever it is. Um, and then the highest range of frequencies, no matter what kind of soprano you are, is about 5,000 hertz. Now, other animals have different ranges for their vocalizations. Some, some we can hear, some we can't hear. Now, the important thing that we wanna realize here is that when you're building a communication system, 
you're worried about one of these ranges and not the other. And the one that we care about is the range of human speech. So it turns out that our entire communication system, at least as far as telephony goes, is based on the range of frequencies for human speech, or at least the majority of those frequencies. So if we're trying to communicate with somebody, you want to pick up all of those frequencies. So no matter how low they're speaking or how high they're speaking, uh, and there's a limit to the amplitude too or the, the sound volume, but that range of frequencies is what we're worried about. So it turns out that the telephony system is based on this 0 to 4,000 Hertz. And it turns out that most of the frequencies that we generate are in the range of 300 to about 3,300, maybe 3,600. So that's the range of human speech. So it doesn't matter how high or low my voice goes. And this is also why some things don't sound very well or sound very good over the, over the telephone because a lot of the frequencies that you might be uh, encoding in the source are not going to be picked up very well. So you wouldn't want to listen to a symphony or an orchestra or a variety of animal sounds over the phone because all of those frequencies would be sort of modified or um, encoded as different values than they actually are. Now it turns out that codecs that we use for picking up and quantizing and sampling the voice are all based on this range of frequencies. So let's remind ourselves about something we were talking about when we went over traditional telephony or some of the big ideas. Remember that DTMF phone, the one with the buttons? Well, the range of frequencies of those buttons falls inside this nice, neat 3300 down to 300 hertz. So when we push a button, we're getting the column frequency and the row frequency. So you pick up two frequencies, dual tone multi-frequency. All of the sounds that are generated on that phone are also in that range of frequencies. So the busy signal, for example, is 480 and 620 hertz put together. So everything is based around this range of frequencies. Even dial-up modems have a carrier wave that's inside that set of frequencies. All right. Remember also that when we were talking about a DS0, we talked about that it was 64,000 bits per second, or 64K. And that comes from two things, the sampling rate and the quantized values that we're going to assign to each sample. These come from the codec, which of course now we know is G.711. So those magic numbers all come from G.711. So 64K is a really important number when we start dealing with uh, telephony systems. So let's drill down a little bit into how this actually works. Now this is an example of a voice encoded uh, series of words. It's just actually a three word phrase. Here we go. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so there we go. The word hello three times. Now this is what it looks like when you've actually collected it and sampled it. So we're gonna see what we actually have to do accurately reproduce this signal. So this is, you know, a couple of seconds long, but if we zoom in on just two hundredths of a second, we can see that the waveform looks quite a bit different than this over here. And this is the thing that we're actually trying to accurately record or accurately reproduce on the end. So we got to capture it and then reproduce it. Time to sample. So we take that same clip, right? We're actually going to zoom in a little closer here. And the vertical lines represent the actual individual samples. Now, the famous Nyquist and Shannon have come up with the, the sort of rules for how to accurately reproduce a signal. And to accurately reproduce a signal, you've got to have the correct sampling rate and the correct quantizing values. It turns out that there's a magic number that's associated with reproducing a signal and it is directly related to the input frequencies. So if the range of human speech is 0 to 4000 Hertz to accurately represent any one of those frequencies we have to sample it at twice the rate. So in communication systems what we typically end up doing is sampling the signal at 8000 times a second. So these vertical lines here would be in one second you would have 8,000 of them. So that's part of it. 
The other part of it is what value do you assign to, to each uh, sample? When we look at a, uh, a frequency, what we're trying to avoid is missing certain things about the frequency. And the arrows indicate areas that are in between the samples. So in this particular graphic, this sampling rate is probably not high enough to get all of the artifacts of the signal. So you would completely miss the value of this here, this here, all of these really interesting areas would be completely missed by a sampling rate at this value. So again, in order to accurately reproduce any signal, you've got to sample it at twice the rate of the highest frequency, or at least twice the rate of the bandwidth. So we would have to increase it here. So again, 0 to 4,000 hertz, we sample it 8,000 times a second. OK, what do we do about the values? Well, for the values, we're going to assign certain numbers here to our horizontal lines. So every one of those horizontal lines represents a value that we can assign to the amplitude of the signal. And if you think about it for a sec, what you're going to get is 8,000 samples in one second. And then if you were going to graph them, you would graph the amplitude. And in that way, you would recover the original signal. So that's what we're going to do at the other end. But the question is, what's the right number of levels? How many do we need to ensure that we don't run into things like quantizing error? So we can see a couple of these that are not on the line. Some of them are right on the line. Very nice, very nice, very nice. But what about these ones that are a little bit in the middle? What, what's going on there? Well, that's what we mean by quantizing error. So when we have a value that is in between the lines, what ends up happening here with a value like this is it has to be assigned to either the lower or the upper value. And it turns out that some amplitudes, some signals, are worse uh, or have worse problems with quantizing error than others. And this is just a close-up of the issue, right? That's the actual sample. And then we would probably have to assign it to a value nearby. So we've got the number of samples per second. And we've got the number of bits per sample, or the number of samples. So it turns out that the, the number of values that we assign in G.711 is 256. It's not quite 256, but we assign 8 bits per sample. So that's 256 possible values. So if we look at the actual way that the codec works, there's a, you know some keywords and tricky phrases in there. Some, there's some graphing values in there. I'm not going to worry about that today. Suffice it to say that we're going to sample 8,000 times a second. And each sample is going to be allocated 8 bits, or 256 possible values. So 8,000 samples per second times 8 bits per sample, 64,000 bits per second is the throughput or the bandwidth required. So what goes on at the other end? Well, of course, now you're receiving a stream of values. And that stream of values represents the quantized samples from the original sound. So you take the values, you assign them to amplitudes at a rate of 8,000 samples per second, and you end up rebuilding the, uh, the original signal. Transmit that for sound, and we get something that we can pick up with our human ears. Now it turns out that a complex signal is almost never exactly equal to the one that was originally created, but it's close enough that our human ears can't distinguish the difference. Now here are a few more technical details regarding a couple of the major codecs. We've been talking about G.711, and every codec sort of comes from G.711. G.729, we see that used in a lot of uh, VoIP deployments, especially with Cisco, but we also see a lot of G.711. So if you're looking at an RTP stream, and you look at the payload type, you're going to see very commonly G.711 or G.729. In systems where there's high packet loss, things like that, you might have a crazy codec like G.722. But far and away, in my experience, uh, G.711 and G.729 are the most popular codecs on a VoIP system. And if you want to look more at these, you can take a look at the ITUT recommendations. And here's a link below. So what about video? Well, it turns out that video has the same thing. You're bringing in all of this analog data, and you got to figure out a way to encode it. And so we have video codecs as well. And it turns out that they have as their basis pulse code modulation. It's a little bit different animal because it's video, but it is still analog data. So we still do a similar thing. Plus, there's a soundtrack. So today, 
uh, the video series or the video series codecs that we sort of follow are the H.26X series culminating in H.264 and then the MPEG series, you know, MPEG, MPEG 3, MPEG 4. So it turns out that H.264 and MPEG 4 are the same thing. Two different documents maintained by two different organizations, the ITUT and the Motion Picture Experts Group, but same, same, uh, same standard. And there's a couple of links for, for them. So this has been a short video on codecs. We talked about some of the frequencies that are involved, the process of pulse code modulation, and the standards, which we now know come from uh, ITUT, the original standards. Now there are other codecs, right? VP8, VP9, Opus. Uh, there's the stuff that we do for WebRTC. There's a collection of other codecs. In fact, um, when I used to do a lot of gaming, there was a tremendous number of codecs that were out there. But if we're talking about voice over IP systems, the standards that you're usually going to run into are something like the ITUT G series. And then, of course, we've got video, which is the H series and the MPEG series. And today we're going to be H.264 and MPEG 4. Now, for resources, in addition to those websites that I, I mentioned in this video, I completely forgot. A couple of years ago, I wrote a book on this. So in the Packet Guide to Voice Over IP, we have Chapter 5 on Codex, and there's a short video that hits the high points of the chapter, which you can watch along with this one. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Like and subscribe if I helped, and may those VoIP packets always reach their destinations, regardless of what codec you're using.